there are people who smoke three packs per day and they'll blow out all the candles at 103. But there are other folks who don't smoke at all and die of lung cancer at 30. And so we don't know those variables unless we look at them. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited for a special guest who is an expert in some very important topics that we're going to talk about. We have Dr. Florence Kamate, who is a clinician, scientist, and innovator in the field of precision medicine. She is world-renowned for her expertise in predicting and preventing chronic disease by reversing biological aging, obviously a hot topic that we're all interested in and can't wait to dig in more here today. She is a graduate of Yale School of Medicine, where she was a faculty member for 25 years with a triple appointment in endocrinology and reproductive endocrinology. And she trained at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in Maryland. In 1992, she founded Women's Health at Yale. And in her book, Keep It Up, she unveils a roadmap to supercharge your health and vitality from shredding stubborn belly fat and slashing diabetes risk to sculpting your physique with lean muscle and sharpening your mental edge. We'll talk a lot about that today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward uh, to engage in the conversation. Absolutely. Well, you've been doing this a long time. You actually mentioned uh, before we started recording that you've been working with uh, testosterone, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, in more detail for 20, maybe even 30 years, which is much longer than I've heard many other people talk about it, which is very interesting because I think a lot of the knock on testosterone these days is, oh, there's not a lot of long-term history uh, showing its you know, safety or, or efficacy or, or whatever the case may be. It's, it's very new and people are kind of afraid, but it is the whole big new craze these days. So let's actually start with what are some of the things that have changed that you've kind of changed in your approach and how you're operating in medicine and in your practice now compared to maybe when you were getting started? That's a great question, um, Taylor. The beginning of my career, it was clear in medicine that we get taught reactive medicine. Like someone gets sick, mm -hmm. there's a problem, it's a chief complaint, go into a doctor and we jump all over it, which is necessary and great. And, but when I began to start seeing um, my patients, I realized that there was lots going on under the surface that hadn't been detected yet. And it takes a very long time for diseases to emerge. And I was fortunate enough to do a journal club, as you mentioned, my career at Yale, where all the departments get together in endocrine, uh, children, adults, men and women, um, those sections. And I was able to say that you know, in the mid thirties, we begin to really change below the surface. We know that we're not the same, but there's a lot of great excuses. We're having a family, you know, we're working hard. We're trying to make it in our career. But even if you're a triathlete or a marathon runner, or you really take impeccable care of yourself, change happens anyway, because we're genetically predestined with variants in our genes and the way gene express, genes express themselves to kind of do different things and not to necessarily age in great shape. And that's when aging starts hitting us in our 30s. We may not recognize it because we're still going gung-ho, but it's pretty inevitable. And most folks, by the time they go to like their 20th high school reunion, look around and realize the cheerleaders may not look so hot anymore and the football players are, you know, have a pot belly perhaps. And there's reasons for that. And what's happening is there's change happening under the surface. So for me, it was about how do you detect that? And can you see it in the pictures and the biomarkers? And so I started pretty early on because my background was as a scientist investigating numbers. And I was, I'm a geek and I like numbers and I can see connections in the systems of the body, like how the system works, why it works the way it does. I don't think of, uh, the way we, the other difference in the way medicine is practiced is a lot of the fields are like silos. So there's a cardiologist there, there's a neurologist here, there's an immunologist here. And I'm sure you've shared your own story and figured out that journey yourself when you were quite young. And that's mm -hmm. frustrating because no one's on the same page about your entire system. So that's another big, big piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly is when that hit me was in my early 30s, my health challenges 
We see athletes are typically retiring around age 34, 35, right? So everything is very consistent with, with what you're saying here. And so right. I guess peak, many peak is usually around 27, 25 to 30. And that's always our goal. How do we reverse biological aging? And I tend to do it physiologically. So when we get into the topic of hormones, I'll talk a little about a distinction between what we generally do and what's really going on in the rest of the country and world. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's jump right into reversing biological aging, because I'm sure every person listening right now is saying, I would like to reverse my biological <laughs> age. So uh, how do right? I do it? <laughs> so the first place to start is to understand your own health story, as you know well for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that means beyond like what is the one thing bothering you, which we may all have one thing like we don't sleep well or we don't eat well or diabetes runs in the family or heart disease or Alzheimer's, stroke, you name it, cancer. But it's about your entire system. And beginning in the 30s, exactly as you mentioned, our body begins to fall apart actually under the surface at the cellular level, both metabolically, hormonally, and in terms of how our body figures out things based on what our genes dictate and the expression of those genes. So by understanding all of that, you can course correct. So you can own your health destiny for the future. You can have a health span that lasts a lifetime, or sometimes as we say it, your health span should match your lifespan because it's no fun to live to a ripe old age, which a lot of our grandparents and great grandparents have done, uh, and in my case, parents, um, but not be in good shape. And I was fortunate enough, my, my parents really knew some of the great things they did. They're the ones that really encouraged me and set me on this path because they wanted to know when I graduated Yale Medical School, how do I stay healthy? I still remember my dad asking me and um, I have no idea. We learned about disease. We did not learn about health. Mm -hmm. I think there was maybe a half a day or an hour dedicated to nutrition, uh, nothing wow. on exercise. And so you were lucky to panel it together yourself. And that's where I ended up doing precision medicine and healthy longevity because precision is about the data beneath the surface. Yeah. And I know a big part of your approach is that every person is different. Everyone needs a personalized approach. So I assume that starts then when you're kind of working with clients, you're doing certain, certain tests. Can you, can you talk a little bit maybe about the tests that you start with? Yeah, that's actually the core concept, what you just said, that each of us is unique. And I was lucky enough innately, because I was born an identical twin, to know that myself. Like, so when I started this work over 20 years ago, I knew my identical twin was not exactly identical. Our eyes are a little different. Our teeth is different. I'm an inch taller. She's now thinner, but I used to be. But we're about the same at this point. And I love fish and can live on sashimi and sushi. So my mercury was sky high when I first started doing testing. She had no mercury, extra mercury in her body. And even as, you know, disorders present themselves, because all of us are going to cope with something in our life, if not more than one thing, um, the goal being don't get chronic disease. There's no reason to. In, in my view of the world, you age and you age in such great shape that 120, 150, you go to bed, your cells are tired, you go to sleep and you don't wake up. And that's, you could do everything up until that moment. Ski, rollerblade, kayak, climb mountains and all of the rest of it. And so the reason I focused on the uniqueness is I realized that we were the closest you could be genetically inheriting you know, an egg and a sperm that came together and then split, and then we implant in the uterus and then we're born. But we never exist, we never stay in the same place. Like even in utero, we're implanting in different places. And there are identical twins that are different because one gets fed really well and somehow the other one is off to the side and doesn't thrive in utero. And so applying that to each human being made a difference. Being able to look at their story and understand the path they're on. And that's why we do what we do. I think of it as N of one. We're each an N of one. Yet to your first question about how it occurred to me as a scientist, I knew most, I know most papers are population based. You have to see thousands of results. You have to look. So it's, it's not about the unique individual. It's about thousands of people with um, one size fits all, and usually what we call in, in medicine or in science, regression to the mean. So if you think of people as populating a mountain, uh, it's like 
just the top of the mountain where everything centers is the average. But then there are people at the beginning of the mountain, the end of the mountain, if you think of a normal curve, and they could be diametrically different. That speaks to, for example, testosterone. You can have a man at 40 have a testosterone that's 100, a free testosterone. Yet one of them at 25 could have had a free testosterone of 250, which is high, but high optimal. Then the other one could have had a free T of 180. So the one who drops from 250 to 100 is almost dropping by a third, you know, to a third of their amount. The one that goes from 180 to 100 is less than a half. And so each of them could present somewhat differently. They both can have reduced energy, but maybe one has libido issues, but the other one has a strong mind and overcomes a drop in testosterone that's not as significant. So that's what I mean about individualizing and precision. I always thought medicine was personal because it's about the human being. And if you're not personal as taking care of that human being in front of you, you can't practice medicine. You shouldn't be practicing medicine. Right. But the precision to me is bringing data to the table. And mm. so by bringing that data to the table, we can give people the tools to course correct their future health trajectory and not get sick and age in great shape. That's really the goal. Yeah. So I think that what you're saying is 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 really spot on. And I do want to actually ask a little bit. I do want to jump into to testosterone and some of the other things as well. But I do want to also just kind of clarify which which tests and biomarkers for you are the most important then? That's a question I get asked all the time. And mm -hmm. it, it um, to me, I love seeing everything. So I'll look at thousands of biomarkers. And in fact, at the Bespoke Center, which is expensive, and it's Comite Center for Precision Medicine and Healthy Longevity, we even start by giving people a a continuous glucose monitor. I don't know if you've mm. ever worn one. I have one on my arm here nice. and I'm addicted to it. I've worn it for years. When I don't have it, I think I go into withdrawal. Sometimes I say, oh, I can get away with stuff and it doesn't, but it never, my answer, the results never bother me as a human being. I just know because I know I can rework it and it's not fixed in stone for the most part mm -hmm. in most people, which is very exciting because if you know you can change, then it's worth putting effort into something, right? Like you changed your diet and your body changed and your mind changed too. So, yeah. but after 20 years of collecting data prospectively, millions of data points and longitudinally in the same human being, because I set up a way to prospectively monitor where I knew as a scientist and academician, in order to prove it to my colleagues, I'd have to retrospectively show the data. And that's what's happening in today's world. A lot of people are making claims about biomarkers and following things. There's no data, they're just making claims. We actually have the scientific basis for it. And our basis shows there's a 98% correlation between the interventions we recommend and the outcomes, the favorable outcomes where people put on muscle, they turn back the clock, in fact, you might have seen, I don't know if you follow Brian Johnson and his blueprint. Yeah. And his, mm -hmm. so you might have seen this site called uh, Rejuvenation Olympics. And I work yeah. very closely with the guys who scientifically monitor age, biological aging. So you'll always be blowing out candles on your clock, uh, on the chronological mm -hmm. age. That's, that's your chronological clock. And it's ticking all the time. And every year there's an extra candle lit, right? But biological aging is at the cellular level. It's the genes, it's the turnover, it's the way we keep our health. So we are 25% of their leaderboard based on the data that I've accumulated. And most people have one, one person themselves they represent. And right. so you can check that out if you want, or your readers and followers may want to, listeners and followers, by looking up www.rejuvenationolympics.com. And it was created by Brian Johnson and Ryan Smith was behind it in terms of the testing where they are looking at omic age, which is phenomenal. And it's something we can talk about today or at another point. But um, the five key biomarkers have to do with carbohydrate metabolism and cholesterol and testosterone, but not just total testosterone, free testosterone. And those five biomarkers to me predict where you stand today and where you're headed in the future.
And mm -hmm. we've extrapolated that out of the data that we've worked on for years to be able to prove that that is critical to making those decisions about how you choose to live life and what you want to accomplish and how you want to feel. Yeah, yeah. I know it's funny. Everyone always talks about total testosterone when actually free testosterone is, uh, from what I understand, what really matters more. And uh, I think for some exactly. people listening to free testosterone can be reported a couple, two different ways, usually on blood tests. So 100, I think, would be equal to 10 on, on the way some tests report it. Uh, I know Inside Tracker will report my free testosterone. They reported it one time as like 11. And then I took another one and it reported it as, you know, 100 something or whatever, whatever it was, right? So uh, I think there are a couple of different that ways has to do with the that units. they can report um, that, but it is certainly, um, and I'd be curious to know. So for, 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 let's say a male in their forties, uh, uh, selfishly asking what we, what do you, what are free testosterone levels that you would like to see? So by the way, the reason for the differential in different labs is they use different units to report right. it. So if it's mm -hmm. picograms per deciliter or those are the those can vary and then you just have to get a multiplier. But there are different ways to measure it and you can actually extrapolate total uh, free testosterone from total, but it's not as accurate as measuring it directly. And the reason that total is almost meaningless is it's tied up and bound to protein. So total testosterone is mostly bound to sex steroid binding globulin or sex steroids, you know, yeah, sex steroid binding globulin. And as a result, it's not free to act on receptors in the body and throughout the body. So that's why you want free because that's what binds to receptors and, you know, binds to all the cells in your body that require testosterone. And it's beyond sexual function. It's not, it's sexual function, which is libido and ability to get erections and maintain them, but also energy, which most men and women complain about more than anything else as they hit their late 30s and 40s. It's also bone and muscle preventing sarcopenia or loss of muscle with aging. So as far as the free testosterone levels, I'm pretty strict about the fact that in the 20s is when we're optimal. In fact, it's said that athletes peak at 27. I think that's a little tight to say one age, but so I look at 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. And um, by doing so, a free testosterone to be optimal should be 180 to 250. Now, does that mean if someone has 160 one day, it won't be 200 the next day? No, it, it varies. We're not machines. So this is not fixed in time. But that's where I think men in their 40s should be. And it's relative to other factors that we might see in them. But most men in their 40s are lucky to have a free testosterone of 100 or 120 because the body is beginning to change and they're not making as much testosterone. And that begins in the 30s. So you drop your testosterone by one to 3% a year starting in your 30s. And that goes for women and men. And we women only have five to 10%. So we have to make do with it. Part of the reason why women begin to put a little more weight around the middle earlier than men, because testosterone is very critical for muscle loss, and weight gain. And by in lowering it, you see both of those trends. So that's the other reason why testosterone may be important beyond the fact that it's also critical to, to manage sugar effectively and put on muscle. Mm, interesting. And I know we do have a, a lot of female listeners as well. And when we talk about testosterone or free testosterone, pretty much most people, or maybe it's just me, think about men. But are you also using testosterone then, it sounds like, pretty frequently with, with women as well? Yeah, absolutely. Over 20 years. And in fact, the one, a group of women who need it even more are women who have risk of breast cancer, where I don't give them any estrogen or progesterone and either a high risk themselves or they've had it or a close family member like a parent or a sib. And we will use testosterone and block the production of estrogen. So women's levels free should be no lower than six and maybe as high as 30. And some women like it even a little higher, depending on how they metabolize it and absorb it. And it's critical to health because it is one of the factors that starts declining with age. You get sarcopenic and you can see women who look like they're in great shape. And if you look at their body composition, they can be 40 percent body fat instead of 20 percent or less and they have low muscle. 
and they just model fat well, but it's not healthy. And that's critical for avoiding chronic diseases of aging. And that is part of one of the most important measures that you can get on yourself. So with most of us being deficient in free testosterone, there are, there's obviously testosterone replacement therapy, TRT, there's enclomaphene is one that's very popular right now. And another question that is obviously something that myself and many of the listeners, I'm sure, are eager to know about is you've been using testosterone for 20, maybe 30 years now, which is a very long time, longer than most of the people who, you know, just popped up with their testosterone clinic last year and don't have much, uh, much history there. So we'd be curious to know, some, of the, some people are afraid of testosterone side effects, like, oh, what about risk of, I don't know, heart attack or heart problems that people are afraid of? Have you seen any of that? Uh, so I guess a little bit about long-winded question, but either in clomiphene, testosterone replacement therapy, or, or what you're using in your practice. And then over 20, 30 years, have you seen any real detrimental side effects like heart problems that came from people taking testosterone for too long? Uh, no. So that's the simple bottom mm -hmm. line answer. But I understand where it comes from because the literature is ripe with a lot of different studies and they don't look at all the variables and why those cases may be. In fact, if you do look at the literature today, most of it talks in a very, most of it's very positive about testosterone. It affects on the heart because it's a muscle. The reason why the negative issue is if you just give a man testosterone, let's say in their 70s or 80s, and um, they, they end up, they, they maybe already have underlying heart disease, you can increase, thicken the blood, the blood gets you know, stuck and kind of in, it doesn't freely flow because you can increase red blood cell manufacturing. And as a result, that leads to a problem, but it's not the testosterone directly. And so you have to be mm. careful to monitor certain aspects of use. Now, I don't ever think of it as testosterone replacement because I'm not mother nature. Mm. And I, so I think of it as optimizing hormones and optimizing health. So we optimize hormones and get to a point Again, this comes from my, my scientific background and training, risk benefit. We look at what are the pros and what are the cons. And in general, in the sweet spot, not super, super mag doses of testosterone that you might see in gyms, that's inappropriate or growth hormone. That hurts the body. And a lot of, sadly, a lot of people who abuse it die very young. They grow their organs too big. If you've been in gyms, you've probably seen people who look like they have they're in great shape, but they have a pot belly and it's not fat. It's usually their organs are overgrown because of wow. the combination of very high doses of testosterone and HCG. It's just like using anabolic steroids and that isn't yeah. good for any aspect of the heart. So we believe in functioning physiologically and we use, we tend to default to HCG, which is human chorionic and anatropin. And in men, what happens is they're able to make testosterone but they're not getting the signal from the brain. And HCG is I almost identical to the signal from the brain, a hormone called LH or luteinizing hormone. And it stimulates the testes to make testosterone, your own natural testosterone. So I have to say that I'm more inclined to do that. Now at some point men, and it could start in their forties, it could start in their eighties, will no longer respond to their own stimulation, to the stimulation we give them. And at that point, they need testosterone. So we have all sorts of protocols to have a male make his own testosterone as late as possible because it's associated with positive aging and longevity. When your mm -hmm. testes are active, you know, throughout life and you can actually father a child late in life, there's some correlation with that. Also, in women who get pregnant later in life, they live longer, biologically speaking. And so our goal is always to do what's physiologic and matches the body as opposed to taking over for the body. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. It's, it's interesting though. HCG, I don't know much about it, but I, I just know that from what I heard, people who take testosterone oftentimes take HCG with testosterone. I had never heard of people only using HCG. Is that what you were mentioning? Yes, yes. We only use it until a man, and that could happen any decade of life. It usually drops out at 50% beginning in the 50s, like people don't respond as well to it as they had. So the reason that's tried, and I'm not sure it's really even worth it, 
it because once you give testosterone, you're shutting down receptors and you don't have those receptors. So the notion is you're rescuing your body and your testes don't shrink as effectively when you're on testosterone alone. Because so for some men, when you give them testosterone, their testicles don't have to make and stop making testosterone. It's not permanent. If you stop it, they can, depending on the decade and where their own development is, it's not a permanent reaction at all. You can stop and start. You just have to know what you're doing. And com mm -hmm. combining it at the same time, I have never found to be useful. I think largely it's a waste of money, I think, because HCG can't do much once you're on testosterone. It's great, really though, for fertility, too. You use it for fertility mm -hmm. because it encourages spermatogenesis and growth. It's what we use in young men who don't go through puberty, who have conditions called Kalman's and others where they don't pubesce. And by pulsing HCG, you can actually cause puberty to happen. Very interesting. And so HCG yeah. is an injection as well? It is an injection. You can't take it orally, but you only take it twice a week. And unlike testosterone, it's a tiny little needle. Like you can barely see it. It's not even like mm -hmm. a straight pin. But testosterone is the more practical solution for most people. And you can get it a lot of different ways. Now they have automatic, more automatic dispensers with it. Or you can also take it in a syringe and then inject it. I was also one of the first to use it subcutaneously as opposed to intramuscularly. And in the old days, they would give it every two weeks if they thought somebody needed it. Let's say they had testicular cancer as a young man, and then they needed to be given testosterone. But it turns out that every two weeks is insufficient. You really need to take it at least once a week. And in some men, they burn through it so quickly, they need it twice a week. So doses mm -hmm. have to be modified. So we tend to start with HCG and then move to testosterone or cycling with testosterone and HCG and then move to testosterone as men stop responding because they're getting older and that was their natural life expectancy of their testes. Because the issue is the stimulation to the testes is what starts to fail in men. Somehow the brain that controls the hormones that stimulate the testes, the pituitary and the hypothalamus, do not respond to low circulating levels, unlike when you're in your 20s and early 30s. And as a result, mm. your testes can manufacture testosterone just fine. They have to be stimulated. And that's what HCG does. Interesting. Is that what enclomiphene does as well? I think it can, but it's more complicated than that because it has other impact on the body. So as I started saying, I think a little in an earlier question, I actually have patents for clomiphene showing that it acts as an estrogen on bone and increases bone turnover in a positive way, particularly in groups of women that have had endometriosis and fibroids and may have been suppressed in some fashion. We have studied that years ago at Yale and I published that data. Um, but I'm not a fan of using any form of clomiphene in men because I feel like it doesn't, do, it doesn't do what I like it to do physiologically speaking. So when I use the term physiologic, it's a more scientific way of saying, let's be natural. I just mm -hmm. think there are some natural things that are not good for you either. But um, having said that, I like to say, let's work with the body as opposed to taking over for the body. Let's yeah. make your body do all that it can do well. Because by increasing testosterone, you're going to stop uh, chronic diseases of aging because you're not going to become sarcopenic. You're going to be able to house sugar better because you have muscle. And that's what really weakens us with aging, the loss of muscle and the inability to maintain it. And it's more than testosterone. You need to eat enough protein, at least a gram per kilogram per day. You need to do resistance exercises, not just aerobic, at least two or three times a week. And Together as um, a package, you will sustain your health. If you want the secret to healthy aging, I would start right there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's so HCG, just to wrap up on HCG, you've seen HCG alone in both men and women uh, increase free testosterone quite substantially. Not in women. Women Not are different women. than men. Okay. You know, Got it. as my mother told me, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. Not quite, <laughs> but it feels that way. We mm -hmm. women hit a wall. We actually, once we hit perimenopause, which typically happens in the 40s, and some women it can be a month, and other women it could be 10 years. By the time we're 50, the majority of women have had their last period. And that's because the eggs that develop 
over the menstrual cycle. And we usually develop one follicle and makes an egg, it ovulates mid-cycle, and then we get a period 14 days later, begins to decline even at birth. So little girls are born and when they're born, they have fewer eggs in their ovary than in utero. And as the years go by, we kind of use up our eggs. So we hit a wall. We can't really stimulate the ovaries or the testes, uh, the ovaries in women, except if you're going through IVF and you still have some residual function, then you can, but you use different kinds of hormones. HCG mm -hmm. is part of it, but only to ovulate. So the makeup for women and the makeup for men dictate different outcomes. That's why men who have more testosterone than estrogen do better with bones for longer than women because testosterone is powerful in terms of bone formation. We women begin to get osteoporosis and fracture our wrists before 10 years before men. The, and, mm -hmm. and then we go on to our hips and spine. Then men catch up with us as their testosterone falls. But they have, so, we have 10% at best of what men have. With the reverse is true with estrogen. So all of us have almost all of these hormones except PSA, which is, you know, a peptide that's made by a protein that's made by the prostate. We women don't have a prostate. So, but, so you can't stimulate the ovaries with HCG. You have to give women testosterone in order for them to get it. And you usually do that as a cream as opposed to men where you can use a cream, but it's not as good because it, there are enzymes in the skin that translate that cream to more estrogen and another hormone called DHT or dihydrotestosterone. Mm. And those hormones can cause other reactions in the body. We don't want men to have high estrogen or high DHT because it can relate to prostate growth, loss of hair, and in estrogen, getting in touch with your feminine side, which might not be too bad for some people, but you don't really <laughs> want to cry at chick flicks. And you right. don't, you know, so the estrogen has to be balanced appropriately. So as I said, I'm about the data and we look mm -hmm. at it at each unique person. And that's mm. really critical. Interesting. That's great. So great. We covered kind of like hormone optimization and we talked about the importance of also taking in protein and muscle, muscle building and, and what else in terms of longevity have you seen that's important for people to know about or, or focus on? Um, it's important to focus on what runs in your family because your family dictates what your genes are expressing. And as I mentioned at some point, the genes are important, but you, your genes don't have to be your destiny because right. it's the expression of genes. And by eating differently and sleeping and taking care of yourself, in ways that even a triathlete or a marathon or you know competitor may not be doing to their body type and their profile, you can change your future tracking. Your future health trajectory is only partially dependent on the way you're built and the way you were born. And expression of genes can change. So for example, in your case, you found that eating paleo um, made a difference in your health. Well, some people find that fasting helps. But something to keep in mind, and it's not necessarily applicable, just because caloric restriction works in rats doesn't mean humans are rats. And caloric restriction in all humans may not be the best path for everyone. Some people can fast fantastically. I'm one of those people. I can go all day. I just finished my morning shake a little while ago, and mm. that's it. I'm getting hungrier again. But other people get into trouble if they, try, if they don't eat every three hours. So having yeah. a snack, for example, with protein, starting with, always with protein, everything you eat is another good tip because of the way your body then stimulates your carbohydrate metabolism, your sugar and insulin. It's more paired and you don't go out of sync. Your sugar doesn't go high or doesn't go low. I think if I'm going to point to another important, probably the most critical uh, variable is sleep, getting mm -hmm. adequate sleep is like the best way to protect your health. And there are studies that show that when, you, when people don't sleep um, adequately in terms of enough hours and the quality of sleep, they get heart attacks earlier, diabetes, they get stroke, Alzheimer's, and, and there's data on that. So, and I've had, did it, an experiment on myself, not intentionally, but I tend to get six hours of sleep, although I love more. And on weekends, I tend to make up more sleep. And there was a period of time that I slept only four hours 
a night in developing the app that we're trying to scale this kind of information to everyone by a virtual medical app called Rock Health. And by only sleeping four or less fewer hours a night, I ended up increasing my biological age by 15 years. That was not wow. a fun thing. This happened back in 2021. And I was actually measuring my biological age every month because I was working, as I mentioned, with Ryan Smith when he was developing True Diagnostics and Omic Age. And the first three months of plasmapheresis, which is what I was testing, which means young blood for old blood, but mm. what the route I took was taking my own unit of blood, uh, then replacing the red blood cells, giving them back to me, but cleaning the plasma, my age dropped by 15 years biologically in three months because I was wow. sleeping six or more hours a night. And then I flipped into a few hours because I had a lot of demands and I had to do this work at night because my days are way too crazy. And that's when my age went back up and it boomeranged. And so mm -hmm. sleep is absolutely vital. When I started this work, I used to think it was exercise, food, sleep, and I flipped it. It's sleep, it's sleep, food, exercise, and restorative practices like meditation, like Qigong, like Tai Chi, like yoga, those make a difference too in your equanimity, your production of cortisol, which is another issue when we're under stress. Some of us turn on the cortisol gene, but deep meditation actually stops that gene from switching on. So there's mm. a lot of ways to biohack the system in a practical way that's pretty easy for everyone. Yeah, yeah, nice. So, I mean, sleep, I think a lot of us have heard about that. We know we, we've heard the importance of that, and I think we can't stress it enough. Uh, interesting, though, about the blood, I, I don't know what you would call it, the, the, the blood plasma process. Plasma phoresis. Blood plasma phoresis, okay. So is that something that you, is that a longevity hack that people should be looking into? Yeah, I think so. I think you have to be cautious because it's new on the scene. I'm not sure buying young blood for and replacing old blood, I'm not sure of the effects yet, but there's data coming along that's very promising, even for long-term chronic disease like long COVID or um, Alzheimer's. And by cleaning up the plasma and serum, the clear part of your blood, not the red blood cells, you can get rid of inflammatory molecules like cytokines. And mm. that creates a better state internally to keep your health. So I think there's merit to that. And while we haven't started doing it on any kind of scale here, I like the data and the outcome. Mm, interesting. And how frequently would you do that, something like that? Based on what I've read, I would look at a three-month process because I think I did it for six months. So I had that built in, you know, like had it because I happened to change my sleep pattern three months into it. And, and what, what's and that got younger. For What's yeah. that process then? For six months, you're going in, what, once a week? Uh, and, and they're pulling your once blood? Once a month. And once a month, okay. And then they pull and blood. And you get it, mm -hmm. right. They draw spin... a unit of blood, kind of like you're donating a unit. But in this yep. case, you're using both arms. So one unit comes out of one arm, and then the red blood cells go into with clean plasma into the other arm. Oh, so wow. you're using albumin, actually, to some extent to pack up your plasma. And then you recreate fresher, newer blood. Testosterone does the same thing, by the way. One of the positives of testosterone is I typically call it the Lance Armstrong effect, is mm. by taking testosterone, you actually improve your red blood cells. And you have to be careful because that's one of the findings that probably contribute to people thinking it's not good for the heart because you make more red blood cells. So a lot of men as they get older can become anemic because their testosterone is low and testosterone recruits the, the factors that allow you to make uh, red blood cells. And there's a condition called polycythemia. If you do that and it overshoots, you need to donate a unit of blood. But what you're doing is actually making younger red blood cells that release oxygen more favorably. And that's why a lot of people who bike and bike mountains like Lance, although he had a particularly unique you know, position because of his testicular cancer, mm. I don't know if you know about that, but a lot of folks try to do that by sleeping in hyperbaric oxygen chambers and, and increasing their ability to release oxygen. So being on testosterone also can keep your blood levels great and you're making younger red blood cells that will keep you stronger and healthier. And sometimes donating a unit of blood 
is good too. I've had a lot of men and women, when they donate blood, their arthritis improve. Like if they have mm -hmm. knee pain or they find that, and, and it's kind of funny because it harks back to the old age where bloodletting was like one of the ways to treat disease. Now I'm not in, in agreement with bloodletting for illness, but for this particular purpose, it's an interesting way to think about, you know, donating a unit of blood um, every so often, like every three to six months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's another reason why people should get a blood test every three to six months anyway, right? <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. You're donating Perfect. some blood. Usually it's not sufficient to be a unit. Even though we draw a lot of blood, it doesn't even come close to a unit, but it's a lot of blood we draw. So yeah, effectively, yeah. when I did it every month, I became anemic. So I needed to get iron transfusions <laughs> when I was testing go. myself. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Last question for you. Uh, what is the thing that you're most excited about in terms of people's ability to reverse their age? And, and I know you talk a lot about, we didn't really get into it, but lifespan versus health span, right? And this is something I'm seeing right now with my father who unfortunately had a stroke a few years ago and has since then has, you know, increased in dementia and he's lost his mobility for the most part, uh, you know, and so I've really seen that. And, and for me, it's like, I really want the health span. I really want to be, you know, to have this. So is there any kind of biohack or, you know, maybe it's the blood thing or, or something else that you're, or maybe it's just testosterone. What are you most excited about that people should have on their radar? Well, first of all, you've already made the first leap. You're thinking about it at a young age and you want to do something about it. And first and second of all, my sympathy on your father. It's not easy to live with a stroke. How young a man is he? Uh, he just turned 83 right now. So actually up until 78 or so, he was a young 78 playing tennis probably two, three times a week. And then... But I think he also didn't tell anyone or didn't get it checked out and had very high blood pressure. He was kind of an old school guy that prided himself on never going to the doctor, unfortunately. And so, yeah. you know, had high blood pressure, probably had uh, high blood sugar, who knows, uh, even though he was quite fit, he didn't always eat the healthiest. So, you know, again, and it's, it's really interesting. And, since and that's he had where the joke, confusion like, comes. So what yeah. I laid out in our podcast, your yeah. podcast, Mm -hmm. is the tools you need. So you need to know your own data. You know yeah. your family history now. You certainly know your own history quite well because at a young age, you had to cope with pretty serious issues and you overcame them, which is a good mm -hmm. sign. The good news is that your father wasn't young. There is a profile that I've seen over and over again, and it runs in different categories. I've seen it in Asians, like Indians. I've seen it in Ashkenazi Jews where there's early stroke and heart disease in the family. It starts in the 40s. And usually there's multiple episodes and many of those folks are gone by their 60s. So you don't have that. You have some longevity if your father was playing tennis at 78. So you're looking at fixable factors. And even in the profile I just described, it just means that it, the, the aging factors are starting even younger. And we have a young guy here who I've worked with whose father was Ashkenazi Jewish, and he, his mother was not. And in his, just those five biomarkers I mentioned, I immediately went to him because we collect this data in the app that I'm developing, Grok Health. And I said to him, so how's your father? Because we don't ask about what age a father is or mother, just what runs in the family. And that's when I found out he had that picture, which I already had recognized over the years. It's a profile. Mm -hmm. And right now, he, at his age, looked like he was 20 years older. Like he looked, his numbers were compatible with a 50 something. And he actually had been told in his 20s that he had high cholesterol and high blood pressure, but they're going to keep an eye on it until it gets mm. more serious. Right. So we've reversed all of that. He's cut and, and he was already experiencing some symptoms at the ripe old age of 33. Mm. And so by understanding blood pressure, which leads to can lead to dementia. It's not only Alzheimer's, it's blood pressure, it's thyroid, it's in, uh, heart rhythms. And by knowing yourself, like basically know thyself and get this data, you can, you don't have to go down your father's path. You can be 120 and in great shape because yep. there are aspects, as you pointed out, that your father didn't know. And it's not even old school. There are a lot of folks who don't bother getting that information and it, it'll hurt them in the end. Now, can yeah. some people get away with it? Of course, there are people mm -hmm. who 
smoke three packs per day and they'll blow out all the candles at 103. Mm -hmm. But there are other folks who don't smoke at all and die of lung cancer at 30. And so we don't know those variables unless we look at them. So I think to go back to the what started you on, what am I most excited about? And mm -hmm. you personally, you should have some of these tests because you're at a perfect time to stop the aging process and not have a stroke and not go down the path. And I don't know enough about your family, but let's say your father. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the thing I'm probably most interested in is variable gene expression and why different strokes for different folks. So we mm. have finally, and this is where I started over 20 years ago as an identical twin and looking at numbers, there's finally a way to look at gene variants that we can marry to the metabolic data and the hormonal data and the lifestyle and your habits and your family history and come up with how you detox, for example, which I mentioned earlier about mm. my twin and I, we don't detox well so breast cancer runs in our family, but it's not because of BRCA. We don't have BRCA, but we don't detox well. So I'm careful with the fish I eat because I don't want my mercury to go up. Mm. I'm careful with avoiding inflammation in other ways. I do the best I can. Do I really do a fantastic job? Let me be completely transparent. There are things you might choose not to do because you feel like you want a quality of life. So one of the ways I'm promised myself I'm gonna experiment this year because I should be gluten-free because of certain markers in my family. My father, sister, my aunt died of a stroke. And there are certain markers that point to me having high inflammatory mar um, risk of a stroke. I don't want a stroke, but I also found it hard to be gluten-free when I lived for a lot of my life in New Haven, Connecticut. The pizza was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love bread. And so I tried it, I hated it for a while, and now I'm going back to it. So I give myself the opportunity to experiment. We should all do that. That's really yeah. the way to do it. It shouldn't be like jump in the deep end. You had to do it. So I'm very right. impressed. You really made choices that turned around your life because you were up against it. Most of us are not until something bad really happens like your dad. And that's why he would have loved to have stopped his hypertension. That's a little pill. I tell you, in my family, my father in his 90s was clear as a bell, but his brother, who was slightly older than him, two years, was had some dementia. You couldn't really talk to him because of high blood pressure. Right. And so those are important variables, like to keep your pressure under 120 over 80 for you, and yeah. even 110 over 70. And that would help you because blood pressure is a genetic trait also, and it's not just from being obese. Some people get it from being obese, but more often than not, it's genetic. Yeah, yeah. So that's and where I, my excitement lays. That's amazing. That yeah, yeah, that's really yeah. great. I think having the full picture and being able to, right, have, you know, know your genetics, have your, have your blood tests, have whatever other tests, and kind of look at it all holistically, I think is, is very, very important. So. Um, this Absolutely. has been amazing. This has really been eye opening. Uh, I know you mentioned your app, uh, and then where else can people learn learn from you and follow you? So we're posting a fair amount at Dr. Florence Comite, D R F L O R E N C E C O M I T E. Um, also at Comite Center, C O M I T E Center, and Grok Health. Um, that's a great way to follow on Insta, Facebook. Um, Twitter or X and LinkedIn, feel free to follow. There's a lot that we're trying to do there. They can check out my book on Amazon called Keep It Up. It is 10 years old, but it's still futuristic. So mm -hmm. I was a little too way ahead of the you know, startup, but now everybody's jumping on board for healthy longevity and anti-aging. And, um, and then um, hopefully we'll have a new book coming out this year and we'll be able to open up rock health to the to everyone because i believe like you asked that everyone should have access to this information because a very little bit goes a long way towards healthy longevity and if you can have your doctor cooperate or a clinician um, you can get the answers you need to keep yourself in fantastic shape for the rest of your life hopefully till 120 or more amazing and the app rock health you mentioned is the app uh can people download that from the app store? And who would that, who would be, who would that app be for? Okay, everyone. 
but it's really targeting 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but we have people in their 80s and people who are, you know, in their 20s. It is not available openly at this point. It will be because we're working with companies now um, first to start. Um, but through those companies, we're doing B2C so p folks can get to it. The irony is if you have an Android, you can actually download it from Google Play, but we'll put you in a special category so that when we do open it up, you'll get the first invitation. We have thousands of people on a wait list. We just can't handle the volume right now. In the iPhone, you need an invite. And then right now we're doing a deeper dive in the folks who come in where we're looking at more factors in them, but it's getting paired back, paired back, paired back. So we're hoping by the time it goes out to the masses, there will be a low end cost where we'll be able to share something I've named my Grok Pearls, where if people upload, like you mentioned doing Inside Tracker, which I've also tested, it doesn't really equate to what we do, but it's helpful. Mm -hmm. It's mainly focused on nutrition, I think yeah. more than anything, because that it was built out of expertise in nutrition and it's only questionnaires. It's not really clinical data um, that mm -hmm. we designed here, but it still could be helpful. Or if your doctor will draw these bloods for you, and in some states you can order your own blood tests. And then, yep. so in the app at a slightly higher price point, after you answer some questions, you can get the MyGroc app. But at a slightly higher point, we might prescribe the continuous glucose monitor, which measures your sugar, which is another phenomenal way to figure out what's good for you in terms of food and working out and the things you're doing, stress, because your sugar will change in response to all of that. Mm -hmm. And also reporting on what your personal data looks like. And that will be a higher price point. But I'm very excited about it because I've dreamed of this for over 20 years that if the numbers I recognized and connecting those dots and integrating it was meaningful, I'd be able to prove it. And now I've proven it and I want it for everybody. So in those days, it was bricks and clicks. And now, of course, it's digital health or virtual medicine. And we do virtual medicine already, but mostly with coaches. This will be automated because we mm. actually have the basis and the data and the, the generative AI for it. So I'm excited. It should be I'm a big man. year. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Thank well, Dr. you. Kamate, thank you so much for joining us here today. This has been incredible. I highly recommend everyone follow you and keep up with your work. And uh, thank you for everything you've done uh, for the health world and community and hope we can do it again soon. Uh, that's so sweet of you. Thank you so much. Sometimes you go day to day and you don't look back at where you, yeah, I'm just looking forward. Like, what can I do next? You know? And yeah. so that means a lot. And I hope I wish you the best of health in 2024. Um, optimal health for uh, forever. Um, and if I can make a difference for you, let me know. I'm happy to share my book with you. I'm happy to introduce you to what we're doing when we're ready to, you know, pull that trigger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybuypeakperformance.com. Com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein. And it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile. So it's really one of the best 
plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.